And we're live. This is another Mark Cody live video. This is the second uh, monthly edition of our first Friday Live. And last month we talked about uh, the shop uh, efficiencies that we uh, have done, we've gained in the last uh, 12 months. This month we're going to be talking about all of the things that we do to a single harpeggi string to make it a harpeggi string from start to finish. And uh, some of those things um, uh, you can do or you might do. You shouldn't need to do most of these things uh, because we're doing them here in the shop for you and we're giving you uh, a really good head start with um, things like action and intonation and volume and so on and so forth. Um, we got Scotty here who is a pro at doing arpeggio setups. He's done many and um, so he's going to be my assistant today for this video. And uh, we also have Connor's here. He wasn't here last time. So let's pan over to Connor. And hey, Matthew. Matthew uh, was not in the last video no, either. And I just have one question for you, Matthew. Yeah. There's a certain dairy product that is yellow in color. Oh, and it's, it's yellow. It's more like a tan in the shell. Yeah, when, when we complete a paint job and the paint job feels good, what is it supposed to feel like? I think it's not cheese. Yeah, like butter? Is that I it? I think that's correct. Okay. I think that's correct. Okay. Um, so let's pan over here, Chris. So we've got this 10-year uh, anniversary K24. In fact, this is the first one. If you recall, if you've been paying attention to our newsletters and so forth since um, last, I believe it was the fall. I think it was October was the 10-year anniversary of the first Harpeggi sale. And um, so this is the first um, of the K24s to be made. And we're actually just finishing this up, and um, I wanted to use this as our example. By the way, uh, we said that we would sell no more than 10 of each model, and there are still, um, you can still buy a 10-year anniversary K24, G16, or U12. Um, we haven't sold 10 of every model yet. Uh, we did sell a good bit of those, though, so far. And just so you know, this is the trim piece that goes on this instrument. You're not gonna see it today because we want to have the hood open so that we can do the work that we need to do today. But that's, that's what it'll look like, of course, under the strings. And what makes this 10 year anniversary unique and pretty cool is that it's the only run of harpeggios that have um, a walnut top and bottom. Um, and you can see we've got this seven layer edge where there's a, uh, a walnut uh, uh, top, there is a binding which is bare uh, birch, then we have white, gray, white, and then birch again, and then the walnut stain on the bottom. By the way, I should mention that we are doing this live video during what CNN is calling a bomb cyclone. Uh, and so if, if the lights flicker or, or, or if, you, uh, if the power goes out, uh, that's probably the reason. But we're going to go ahead and do this anyway, because this is what we were planning to do. Um, and so I guess we'll get started. And I think the first thing I want to do is show you how to take a string off. We're just going to take a string off and go from there. So let's take off number 11, I guess. Yeah, sounds good. And, and first we take off the tuner channel cover. And Chris, why don't you zoom in on the tuner channel. And you can see all the little tuner blocks here. And it's important to know that the, uh, the Harpeggi doesn't use uh, tuning pegs. We, we clamp the string down, and so there's no chance of slippage. And so that's one of the many reasons why the whole Harpeggi holds its tune very well. So go ahead, Scotty, and let's take off the tuner block for number 11. So the first thing we want to do is detension the string a little bit so that we're not uh, having a string pop at us, you know, just as as you would on any other stringed instrument. And we're going to loosen up this set screw and oh, a little bit more. Bring this back a little bit. Not quite. That's funny. Just release it. There, there we, we go. go. All right, so now I'm pulling it down through the bottom. Okay? And if you'll notice, the ball end of the string, if you can see it on camera, was uh, on the underside of the instrument. So now we'll take a fresh string. And um, I'll go ahead and do it on this end. 
And uh, what I'm going to do, this is an Ernie Ball, by the way, an Ernie Ball string, and anybody that gets a Harpeggi gets a list of string gauges provided by Joy, who is our customer experience manager. And, okay, so now I've got a new string, and I don't know if you can get the camera under there, Chris, but let's just show them. Um, well, let's flip it up here. Let's flip it up so that you can see. Whoop, sorry about that. Okay. So there is, uh, I'm looking for the one with the missing string. There it is right there, number 11. But you can do that with the uh, instrument down. Okay. So we now pull it up and then I, I pull it and you can feel the ball as it rests on a ferrule. So what is a string ferrule? Ferrule is a piece of metal that the ball is now sitting in and it does two things. It, one, it captures the ball into the string and number two, it provides a ring terminal that gives us um, contact, electrical contact. Every string uh, uh, gets electrical contact, its own little electrical node on the circuit board. Let's show them the circuit board here. And you can see um, all these little wires, there's a black wire right there. Each string has its own connection to the motherboard and the, uh, that's needed for the electronic muting. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and install the string. And, and what do we do with the tuner block, Scotty? So uh, we wanna make sure that the tuner block is not starting all the way in the forward position. Like um, if this were meeting, if this front of the tuner block were meeting the front of this black plastic, that would be yeah. too far forward. So we're gonna back that up just a little bit, maybe about there. And now I'm gonna pull just a very small amount of tension on the string with my hand. And I'm gonna set that screw so that it just rests and holds the string really nicely. Okay. And now, how, t how, how much do you tighten that, Scotty? What, how do you know when you're done? Uh, tight is tight enough and too tight is broken. So I'm, I'm just sort of going here and I can't really turn it anymore. It's, it's not really, you know, I can turn it back easily, but mm -hmm. it just, it bottoms out. Once the screw bottoms out, yeah. your string is gonna be yeah. held. Yeah, you're not trying to, to smash that string into oblivion because, yeah, it, if, you, if you did, uh, this, it's a screw that's holding it in and it could cut the string. So you don't want to do that. Just make sure it's snug uh, and you should be fine. Now we have this little string end that's, that's hanging out here, a little excess here. So uh, we cut that and, and go ahead. All right. There's a variety of tools that you could use to do this. Um, we use these end cutters um, to do it and you just line it up and clip away. You could also use diagonal cutters um, uh, as, an, as an example there. Okay, so now the string is, uh, is on. We should probably, I actually want to mess up, um, did you mess up this string yet? I didn't. Okay, let's, let's mess it up because this, this instrument has been set up previously. Okay. String number 11, it's this one here. So we're going to mess up its, um, its action. So we're just gonna make this all nice and crooked and completely not anywhere where it should be. And let's, me let's, let's mess up the intonation screw as well. Sure, why not? So we've got this nice crooked saddle, which is not an example. And I'm just gonna rotate this a few times to make sure that it is not anywhere near what it should be. We could use a quarter inch wrench too. Um, yeah. Could somebody get me a quarter inch wrench for the live video? We are live. <laughs> All right. I want to show everybody what we do with the donuts because I'm pretty proud of this too. So let me talk about that. Each string has, on, on an electric guitar, you would see a spring here and that, that spring would, would uh, the purpose of that would be to push the saddle forward. Um, we found through uh, experience that when all you have here is a spring, um, this screw, this intonation screw is free to rotate during shipping. Think about shipping something across the country 3,000 miles on a, on a FedEx or UPS truck and think about the, the amount of vibration that could go through. And so what we do on this, if you look a little closer, we have, um, we have a lock nut and we have an O-ring. And the O-ring provides enough um, flexibility for the, the saddle to move up and down. Um, and then the lock nut locks it in place. So that's what we use instead of springs. We stopped using those a long time ago. Okay, so we've got all our tools. Now, um, let's see. The first thing we should do is let's just get a rough tune on it. All right, and this is string number 11. So let's go ahead and bring it up to pitch, Scotty. All right. And we're just going to give it a rough tune, get it in the neighborhood of where it should be. Ooh, lock string. 
So the string number 11 is F, G. So let me explain the, uh, the note system real quick. The reason Scotty knows that's a G is because we have a notation system. Um, all of the, well these are silver, but normally they're white. Uh, notes on the harp edgy are, are the white notes on the piano. And wherever you have this hole, that's a C, right? So that's a C, that's a C. And to play a C scale, you go C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, okay? And wherever you have four in a row, like that, that's F, G, A, B, we call it F, Gab. And then wherever you have that, there's three, it's C, D, E. So that's a C, D, E, that's an F, Gab there. That's a C, D, E, that's an F gab there, okay? And then the black notes are the same as the black notes on the piano. So you got your C sharp, D sharp, S sharp, G sharp, A sharp, okay? Now, when we do a setup job, uh, one of the first things that we do is what we call default settings. So we, we keep a database of where the intonation screw should be and um, where, the, uh, where the action should be. So let's get our chart out and let's take a look at the default settings for a G16, K24, K24, sorry, okay. there we go, all right, all right, so let's first go with the, uh, the intonation screw, and the purpose of an intonation screw is to make sure that all of the frets are in tune, right, um, uh, the fret, the fret system uh, assumes that the uh, where the string rests at this end is in a particular place, a particular mathematical place. Where that needs to be is different for every string because there's there's an end correction that is associated with each string gauge. So with uh, with uh, thicker strings, there's a larger portion of the string that really doesn't uh, vibrate as much and is not considered part of the the vibrating length of the string. All right, so let's go ahead and let's put this in its default setting. What is the default setting for string number 11? So the default string setting for string number 11 is actually going to be one of our rolling averages. Okay. Um, because we found that as we intonate, as we set certain of our string or intonation screws to certain lengths, yep. we only have to run the others on averages before doing a very specific intonation. Okay, so string, uh, string 9 and string 16 uh, are the ones that are in between it, okay? And so what we do, we've already set the default setting for string nine and string 16. And so what we do when we ramp in between those is we just take and we make sure that visually this saddle is in line with uh, its neighbors, okay? So I'm moving this saddle forward so that we get it right about in between and that's what we call ramping, okay? So that's, that's the intonation part of default settings. Now we can talk about the action. So each string, we define what its action should be at the tuner channel, on this end of the instrument, and also on the bridge end of the instrument. That affects the action on both sides. We've already set the, um, the action at the player end, and the way you do that is with the same exact uh, tuning wrench that um, you use to tune the string. Scotty was using this to, actually it's three uses. You can attach and release the string with it. You can also tune a string with it. And lastly, you can use it on the four screws underneath that actually uh, adjust the action of the entire tuner channel, okay? So that's already been done because this was set up. Um, but what we will do is we will look at the action that uh, at the top fret. And the way we do that is with an action gauge, a string action gauge. We use these, these are from Stuart McDonald. Uh, we, we use several things from them and uh, we're very happy with their products. And so what is the action supposed to be, Scotty, for this one? So the action for that one is supposed to be right around 0 0.90. Okay. Um, because that's, uh, yet again, we do some ramping. String number okay. 12, its neighbor is supposed to be at 0 0.90 and this is going to ramp to either Okay. On either side. All right, so we're going to hold this. What we do is we hold this on um, the top three frets, mm -hmm. like that. And what do you see? Where are we with that? I'm seeing us to be at about 70. Okay, so let's go ahead and raise it. I'll let you do it, Scotty. All right. And let's show them the tool. This is also a tool similar to the one we were using before, but it's, it's, a, it's a smaller one and it works on the two saddle screws, all right? So since this is one of our rolling averages, um, I'm going to be raising this saddle up to be right between the heights of these two saddles, and that should be a really nice height for this string. 
one side at a time and ultimately we want this saddle to be about as level as possible. By the way, feel free to ask questions. We are live. Uh, we're monitoring your questions, so if, uh, if anybody has a, a specific question, go ahead and post it and um, we'll try to get a hand signal and, and answer any questions. All right, so let's go back and let's take a look at this again. I'm going to put this back on string 11 and uh, tell me about where we are. So we are right where we should be, right around 90, just a little bit above. Okay, so the reason that we adjust the action, there's two things. If you set it uh, very low, it'll be more comfortable, but also more apt to buzz on the higher frets. So when you play, you know, down here, for example, it could potentially buzz on the higher frets as the string vibrates. Um, if you set it too high, um, uh, it will be more uncomfortable, but there'll be less chance of it buzzing. So what, we look at, what we're looking for is a happy medium. And we have a specific number that we're looking for. And uh, even, even though uh, we're at the default number, the next thing we would do is to check to make sure it's not buzzing. So go ahead, Scotty, show what we do on every string to make sure it's not buzzing. All right, so we adjusted the height of that one, so I'm just gonna tune it again because action adjustments certainly make a difference in your tuning. So I'm lowering this just a little bit back down to that G. All right, do you want me to just do this string or the whole? Uh, let's just do that string. And I, I'm gonna repeat one more time. Uh, what it looks like we're doing here is complicated. And actually it is complicated, um, but this is not stuff that you need to do. This is stuff that we do for you. This is the labor that, and the love that we put into every single arpeggi to make it a satisfying instrument for you. So we do a lot of work here so that you don't have to. All right, go ahead. So we start at the first fret. No buzz. No buzz. Wonderful. So if it were buzzing, what you would hear would be a, a rattling sound, which would sound like there was something wrong with it, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay, so now we've cleared the buzz. Uh, the buzz. Now, I just remembered we forgot a step, right? Because we have a step in setup, which is called tune, stretch, tune. Yes, right? absolutely. We did the tune part, but we didn't do the stretch tune part. So let's go ahead and do that so everybody sees what we do there. So how do you stretch a string? All right, so I'm going to turn the volume down just so we don't accidentally slap the string to the fret. Uh, always a good idea. So what we're gonna do is it's always a good idea to stretch your strings in the middle of them. So I'm just gonna meet my hands in the middle of this string. I'm just gonna pull it up and down a couple times, over, back, forth, up and down. And you know, just, just like stretching any ordinary string. Right. So now that we've done that, what we're gonna notice is that our tune, or we have lost tune. So, why, why do we stretch it, Scott? We stretch it so that when you get the instrument, your instrument is going to be as close to in tune as possible and it's going to stay in tune. So you're not going to have to waste a bunch of string length tuning your strings. Right. Uh, new strings do not hold their tune as well as older strings because there is a break-in period. And so what we're doing by stretching it is we're trying to uh, get past the break-in period for you so that... Um, like Scotty said, so that it stays in tune longer for you. All right, so okay. we've gotten that back into tune. Right. Um, we have tune, stretched, and tuned. All right, excellent. So now, um, now that we have set the action at, at that end, at this end of the string, we've done our stretching. Um, the next step is intonation. Now, we told you that um, there is a sort of default setting that we, we moved it to by, by ramping, but um, that's only approximate. That only gets us in the neighborhood. But what we really want is to make sure that, that it's actually intonated properly. And, by, and so to do that, Scotty will play at the uh, lower end of the, the, the string and at the higher end. All right, so we're gonna play that first pitch, which is on the first fret of the instrument. That's our G. Now, we're gonna make sure in order to... In so we have that G. get it otherwise the rest of our intonation is going to our intonation is only as good as our tuning I will mention that um, there's a variety of tuners that you can use with your arpeggi we've used these poly tunes by TC Electronic uh, so let's zoom in on that pedal 
Um, this is one that is known to work very well, but there are many that work well. This is just what, what we started a long time ago, and it, and it works perfectly fine. So you, could, you could use that with your harp edge if you like. All right, so it was in tune at the first fret. Yep. Right now, now we want to make sure that the whole string is in tune. So, so we're going to go up to our octave, and we're going to make sure that our all of our frets are in tune by making sure that we are in tune at the octave, which is twelve frets up. And we see on our tuner that we are flat. So we are not quite intonated yet. Okay, so I'm going to adjust the intonation screw up here. It was flat, and when it's flat, things that are flat um, need to get shorter, right? And so I'm going to now take this string number 11, I'm going to bring this towards Scotty to make this string shorter. All right, let's try it again. So yet again, our intonation is only as good as our tuning, so we need to make sure that we tune again. And we are at pitch. It's also very important in this process to make sure that we are hitting on the fret, not back here, because if we hit back here, we're going to be bending the string. There we are. And now let's test that 12th octave again. All right. Perfect. That's a stable pitch. Okay, so now we have a string that is stretched for you, uh, there's no buzz, and that it has proper intonation. Um, the next thing that we are going to do is go for volume, right? The next step. So every string on the harpeggi has its own little volume adjust um, that we can do. And we use a little, this is called a jeweler tool. Um, you can get a little close up of that guy. Um, it's just a little flathead screwdriver. And there's a little potentiometer on the circuit board for each string. So I'm going to find... Well, first of all, go ahead, Scotty. Play. Let's just play strings uh, 10, 11, and 12. Oh, oh gotta put that back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should put this. The reason that we put this in there while we're doing a setup job is to um, make sure that the wires don't come up and hit the string. Okay. 10, 11, 12. You said. Yeah. Already, uh, already good, but I, I, just for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to mess it up. So 9, 10, 11. So here I am, and go ahead and play it. Oop, do we, we're hitting the wire. Okay, I'm going to turn it down. Okay. okay. Now play those three again. Give me uh, 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 Nine, 10, 10. 10, 11, 12. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's a little bit quiet. I don't know if you can tell on camera there, but go ahead and play it again. Does that sound good to you? That sounds like 11 is at the right volume. Okay. So we do that for every single string. And, and a setup, you know, at the shop, it can take anywhere from, I mean, if we have a, a U12 and it's just behaving really well and, and um, it, it's a good day and everybody's in a good mood, I mean, it can take as short as like, I don't know, an hour maybe? Something like that? Yeah, even less sometimes. Um, less than that, perhaps. With a K24, you know, sometimes it can take it can take a half a day. Um, and we do not stop until it plays like butter. butter. Okay, and we do not stop until it sounds like butter. 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 Like, we know what butter is. We, we, we are a butter factory here. Everything's <laughs> got to sound like butter, play like butter. We're not going to let this get out the door, trust me unless everything is perfect. A am I right about that? Absolutely, because you're the man to check every instrument at the end, after right. I've gone through it, after anyone else has, right. and your call is pretty good on how these sound. Yeah. I have personally done quality uh, control on every single harpeggi ever been made. Not a single harpeggi has ever made it out of the shop, ever, without me checking action, intonation, volume, buzz, all that. Uh, for every product, and so um, uh, now that said, there there are certainly people in the shop, Chris, Scotty, etc., who could who could do that, who could QC in my place. But hey, I like to do it because I want to personally make sure that you're getting the best possible instrument that you can. Okay, so we've done a deep dive, and I see I see another shop worker in here that wasn't on camera last week. We got land in here, so we we are a family business. Landon is my son. You saw Connor earlier. He's my son. 
Joy is our customer experience manager, as I said. She's my wife. And, um, and who knows, we have other kids too who may uh, start working this summer as well. Okay. So I think we've done a complete uh, rundown of, of that. And again, don't want to scare anybody. These are things that we do for you. All right. And um, I'll go ahead and I'll put this back on here so you can see again what it looked like. Um, don't forget that um, there are still 10th anniversary Harpeggies available. Not only do you get um, the special cosmetic look, which is the, um, the walnut, um, the, the, silver, uh, the silver graphics. Um, also, we have these chrome volume knobs. If you kind of pan over here, we have this, this chrome volume knob, which is unique to this series. Um, is there a, a serial number label on this yet, Chris? Yep. Okay. So let's show them the serial number label. There is a unique serial number label. If you see, it says 10YR-01. It's 01 because it's the first 10-year anniversary K24 that we're, uh, we're getting to build. And it also says 10th anniversary there. You already, already saw it on the side. Um, I don't know if you noticed this, but if let's zoom in on here. Um, this is... Uh, 2007 is the year that we sold the first Harpeggi in October, and two, 2017, the 10-year. That's on there. You also get a certificate, um, uh, which has the, uh, the gold leafing around it, and it has my signature on it. It has a duplicate of that serial number in the center of it, and it shows you, uh, you know, that it's, it's authentic. And that's something that you can keep with the instrument um, as a keepsake. And I believe one day this will be, all of these will be collector's items. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, there are no questions on this actual video, but there were a few from last time that we didn't get to. So, okay. um, you know, someone asked, but Rex Crenshaw asked, are, are the beginner lessons ready now? Are oh, the beginning lessons? So there are, uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, there's a, there's a Harpeggi YouTube channel. And you can see uh, a few different playlists on there. One of those playlists is a how-to playlist. And in there, we show you how to tune the Harpeggi, how to clean the Harpeggi, um, how to restring the Harpeggi. But there's also um, a, a set of four beginner how to play videos uh, made by Gary Waugh, who did a great job of explaining you know, major scale, minor scale, uh, minor chords, major chords, and, um, and so you can see that. But I'll give you a tiny lesson um, here, uh, so if you recall, I, I was showing you the note system, and all of the the silver notes here are the white notes on a piano. So to play a C scale, you would what I do is I do one two three slide one two three slide. So I'm using these three fingers, right? So one two three slide one two three slide. Okay, and we should put that back in there. Um, one two three slide one two three slide, and you can keep going one two. Three, Slide one two three slide. Okay, so that's a, that's a C scale. It's also the same exact fingering for whatever F sharp scale. One two three slide one two three slide. I could start that on any note and it would be the same. I'll start on A. Okay, all major scales, all minor minor scales have the same fingering regardless of the root note. Same goes for chords. So I'll show you a simple triad. I'm going to play a C major chord, which has the notes C, E, and G in it. And the way I like to play it is like this, with the G on the bottom, G, C, E. Because that's very comfortable. So that's a simple triad. If you want to see, uh, I can also add that root in to make it even deeper, right? So in that case, it was C, G, C, E. Right? Now look at the position of my fingers. If I want to make a D chord, I can hold that fingering position and go up one string. That's a D. That's an E. I can also slide it up one fr fret to go to F. Right? Uh, when you think about piano, uh, if you have to learn all the different chords on a piano or a guitar, uh, they're all different. And so you have to develop a muscle memory and, and, a, and, a, and you have to memorize all of the fingerings for all the chords. In the case of the Harpeggi, we've made it much, much easier for you because it's the same regardless. Any other questions? Um, what is the tuning of the Harpeggi? The know? tuning of the Harpeggi is in whole tones. So when you go from left to right, um, it's in whole tones. So a whole tone scale would be C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and so on. <laughs> Okay, 
okay, that's a whole tone scale. When you go this way up the frets, it's more similar to a guitar fretboard in that it's semitones. Okay, so those are semitones going C, C sharp, D, E flat, E, and so on. Now, all of these notes, if you, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but um, uh, these are all the same C, right? Okay, so going this way, it's really the same note. Going this way is up diagonally, okay? And so you can hear different tones, like when you're down here, it sounds more nasally, and it gets rounder as you go further and further up the fretboard. Listen, listen how different this sounds from that. So there's a range of tones, and you'll find that for whatever song or whatever you're playing, that there's a, there's a sweet spot uh, that you might like, uh, depending on the song that you're playing. Like for example, if you're playing funk, you might you might you might want a more nasally tone down here. Um, whereas if you're doing um, you know something that's more sort of classical guitarish, then you, you kind of hang out on the on the top end of the fretboard. Okay. All right. Another there, question? I was. Um, Ted Wazlewski asked on the last video, is there a difference between the body woods? Yeah. And how they make how it sounds. Yeah. So there are there are some uh, small differences between the different woods. And um, the woods that we avail are available are right here. And so we have uh, birch is our standard material. That's a 25 ply birch. Um, these happen to be birch. We also have maple. And that's a um, 13 ply hard rock maple. And the color's similar, but you can see the maple's a, a little bit more warm. The birch is a little bit more pale in color. And then we have uh, bamboo. And here's a bamboo uh, harpeggi here. Um, this is a pretty cool looking one. It doesn't have its cover on it, but um, it's got some Art Deco uh, artwork here in gold that is uh, that the customer wanted. He actually had a an Essex piano in his living room that has the same stain, and also it has this sort of design on the music holder of his piano. And so he wanted to put his harpeggi in his living room near his piano, and he thought that would be um, a cool way to do his custom harpeggi. So. We're really proud of the way that, that that's stood out. And what's cool with bamboo, bamboo is that you can give this five-layer look on the edge by, uh, by some clever masking that we do. So you see here you have the stained light bamboo, the light bamboo, the dark bamboo, light bamboo, and then the stained bamboo again, giving that five-layer look. So if you want bamboo, that's what you can do. But the question that Ted had was about the sounds. So the sounds, um, uh, I would say that in my opinion, the bamboo um, has the most acoustic sort of quality to it. Um, it's the the heaviest material um, and, uh, and 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 the hardest material, and and therefore uh, it it has the most sort of brilliant sound to it. Um, I think the birch has the the darkest sound. Uh, it's also the lightest material. So you should theoretically uh, get more sustain the most sustained with bamboo, although. All harpeggios have really great sustain because their body mass is so heavy compared to a guitar, for example. Uh, so they all have really good sustain, but 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 theoretically you're going to get the best sustain with the bamboo and and middle sustain with the maple and then the least sustain with the uh, the birch. But they're all good and they all sound great. I think mostly um, the difference is um, uh, in the way it looks. It depends on you know if somebody wants, for example. Um, to, to a, a stain, like a light stain on their harpeggi, I would probably recommend um, either maple or birch based on that. Like, let's say you wanted to stain it a, a sky blue or something, then I would recommend a lighter wood. If you're going to do a darker stain, I might recommend bamboo because it's always better to, to start with a, a darker material when you have a dark stain. Um, the other thing to consider is dimensional stability. Um, as I said, we, we do a lot of uh, a lot of things to, to get it set up properly for you, and um, the uh, the longer you know, every musical instrument made of wood um, deals with uh, a shrinking body, right? Um, wood, by nature, it has a moisture content when you start building the instrument, and then they all will lose some moisture over time, and so they can shrink a tiny bit. Uh, pianos, guitars, violins, you know, all of these instruments do that. And so um, you want, uh, so 
with with a material that's going to kind of hold its uh, dimensions, you know, better, like the 13 ply hard rock maple. Um, there may be less need to say uh, adjust the intonation or the action or that that kind of thing down the road. Uh, and I'm not talking about five months or, or I'm talking about five, ten years down the road. Um, you might want to adjust things. And um, I would say that um, you know we can certainly do setups here. But most people that are familiar with doing a guitar setup should be able to uh, know how to adjust the intonation of, of these. These are guitar saddles. So um, uh, anybody that knows, a, a good guitar luthier should know what to do. Okay, a any other questions? Uh, there was from the last video, yeah. Gary, uh, Gary Dunn also asked, okay. how does an average guitar player expect to play this? Expect to play? Yeah, how would they, okay. how would they get on with this? Okay. This exact quote. So um, guitar players, um, they already have the tactile thing down, right? They're used to they're used to strings and frets, and they're used to uh, you know the, the, the touch associated um, with uh, uh, you know with making a chord, for example. Um, and uh, you can play chords on the harpeggi. Uh, you can strum chords on the harpeggi. And if you notice, I'm strumming all of the strings. But you're only hearing the four strings that I'm actually playing right now. Okay, so guitarists, you know, from a rhythmic sense, they're used to uh, strumming rhythms. Um, they're used to, um, for example, the fact that you have to play just behind the fret. When, when you're fretting a guitar chord or a note, you want to be just behind the fret, right where our note marker is versus being way back here. And uh, so these are the kind of things that um, a guitar player is going to have as an advantage um, uh, playing the harpeggi. Uh, keyboard players as well have their own set of advantages. They're used to having the low notes on the left and the high notes on the right. They're used to the, the white and black marking system, note marking system of a piano. Um, and they're also used to playing with uh, ten finger independence. So um, no matter you know, it, you don't have to play any instrument to start the harp edge, okay? Because it's an easy instrument to 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 learn. It's an easy instrument to to um, to get up on the learning curve with. Um, and uh, it's also uh, I, I think it's a very accessible instrument in that you know to to make one note you know you can walk up to it. A, a kid can walk up to it. <laughs> that right it's like they're used to playing you know or typing on a computer keyboard it's not a whole lot different from that in terms of the motion that you use um, some, with some instruments like I don't know oboe or clarinet or uh, you know violin like just making one note can be a struggle and um, and that's not so with the harp edgy. all those instruments are wonderful and we're not disparaging any of those things but I'm just trying to uh, to explain what went into uh, what went into this. Okay. All right. So I think that's it for today. Uh, was there anything else that I, I was supposed to do? I, I have a list of things I'm supposed to do in these live videos. Did <laughs> well, I hit all the boxes? Ap April sixth, we'll have our next live okay. video. And to make sure you comment and yeah. uh, like the video and let us know what you want to hear and what videos that you want to see also for the next um, video and those going forward. And that is the first Friday in April. Uh, today is the first Friday in March. And we will be doing these as we can, as long as bomb cyclones and things like that don't prevent us. We will try to do uh, one every month. Again, tell us what you want to hear um, next month. And uh, one other thing I want to show, just for the fun of it, we got a new tool, and I'm pretty proud of it. We got a vinyl cutter. And... Uh, we don't have to order vinyl cut anymore. We use uh, the, the markers that are on the Harpeggi are cut vinyl. And so we now have our own machine, right? There you go. Chris is showing you the white and gray markers on that instrument. And so now um, we can cut our own vinyl. And the way this works is very similar to a printer, uh, where a printer would, in this case, um, or a plotter would take uh, ink and deposit on the paper. In this case, instead of dropping ink, on paper, we are taking a blade and we are cutting out the vinyl so that it's in the shape of our logos and our note markers. And that's just yet another step in uh, our own shop efficiencies here. So 
It's new this week. Wanted to show you. All right. Well, that's it. Um, we are. You can still post comments after this is live, and we can get to them as we can. But uh, enjoy having you here with us. Uh, I think our last video got over 12,000 views, so a lot of people are watching. Maybe not live. Uh, maybe you're in the bomb cyclone and, and your power's out. But we will see you next time. And until then, have fun and post your comments and questions. See you later.